Hello, this is Daedalus with Nerds and Stuff, and today I'll be taking this Dark Angels Primaris Lieutenant from this to this. Now let's get started. So we're going to just pick up right where we left off, with the chapter symbol. So I'm just laying down a coat of uh, soft blue. Now this is a really dark navy blue from the Reaper line, and when you're painting white chapter symbols like the Dark Angels are, if you want them to have depth and not really just be a super stark bright white that doesn't seem to mesh with the rest of the detail, you need to have some sort of undercoat that builds up to them. Now some people use blue, that tends to look a little bit cooler, and I think uh, that's cooler on like the temperature scale. I think that looks better for, with the dark greens and stuff. Others will use a brown, and they'll build up to white there, and that looks a little bit warmer. I've heard of red and yellow as well, but uh, those are the two I really use, just the blue and brown. So now we're working on his uh, chapter symbol on the knee pad there. So I decided I'd go with the fourth company for these guys. And if you don't know, the fourth company is kind of that checkerboard with the bone under. And naturally, I picked one of the hardest companies to freehand because I guess I just don't like myself very much. So here I am. I'm not going to be able to do the, the full-blown checkerboard like I would have liked, but this is good enough for my purposes. Um, I elected to go with the fourth company for most of my Primaris Marines because they were all decimated on Cadia. So this is a perfect place for reinforcements to come into play. So now I'm just getting a little bit of the white, and this is, I guess, if you really wanted to look at it like this. This is a white that's built up from brown. When I paint the bone, I usually start at a dark brown, and then I will build up with the bone paint so that it has that depth. It's just now we're adding that one extra layer up to the white. So on this particular model, we're going to have both the cool and warm whites. Which is kind of neat, because you'll be able to see both. And not super well, because we're talking a knee pad versus a shoulder pad. But they're both there. So I'm just coming through with some Agrax Earthshade just straight out of the pot, just to help kind of shade this knee pad. It's really bright the way it is. I want to give the bone a solid look. And while I'm at it, I'm hitting his lieutenant stripe on the head. Now, I, I know the Dark Angel's typical color scheme doesn't really have anything to do with the lieutenant stripes or the captain stripes or anything like that. But I just figured we'll do a little bit of a combination. So you've got your standard painting scheme for the Primaris with the Dark Angels, and then it gives the character a little bit more flair. You know, there's a little less just dark green everywhere and some more character. So now we're taking a little bit of ghost gray, and this is thinned out. I'm applying this in thin layers because I don't want the white to get clumpy. And it's not really a true white we're building up to. We're technically building up to a gray. And this ghost gray is a bluer gray. Um, so we're just building up to this just thin layer by thin layer, because when you're applying these sorts of white paints, if you don't go very thin, and the same can be said for skin tones too, they can get very chalky. And I'm sure if you paint yourself, you've had a model it looks fantastic, and then you're adding the last final trim touches, a little bit of white here and there, and you, by the time you get done, you put that first coat on, and it's just, it's like grainy. It just looks weird. Unfortunately, because white requires so much pigment to give you that stark bright that you want, that pigment can kind of show up in the paint. And that's what that little granulate dust is that gets kind of stuck on there, and gives it that chalky texture. That's, that's your titanium white pigment, or whatever, I guess, specific white they chose to use. So I'm just coming back through with uh, more layers of the ghost gray, and I'm starting to go very precisely. I'm just picking out edges on, like, the feathers and the top of the sword so that I can leave some of that blue undercoat that's bled through the, the first layer of gray so that it looks like shadow, almost. So we're kind of cheating our shadows by painting all of them first and then just layering up above it. And when we get all done, it should look really sharp. So now we're just gonna put a little bit of dry brush of the aged bone onto this, uh, this purity seal he's got down on his leg here, um, just to give it a little more of that dry, dusty look. Um, and then we're hitting the wax real quick with some Mephiston Red. And now we'll be hitting, he's got like this uh, Buzz Lightyear type control pad on his wrist here. 
So I'm just going to pick out a few of these buttons with the Mephisto in red as well. Um, just kind of make it look interesting. I have no idea what these buttons are for or what they may look like on the original paint scheme, but I just figured I'd throw some red on them because red buttons are important. Now we're going to come through with the Mephisto in red and we're just going to start painting the uh, trim on his guns. So we're going to go do this in a couple of coats, but we're just kind of hitting all of these broad stroke areas and then since the red takes so usually so many coats to cover up, especially over a darker color like brown or black or even this dark green, I'm just going to start there instead of with the metallics because the metallics I can just trim in real easy. Uh, especially with the nice brushes I've got, which if you were going to ask me in the comments what my brushes are, I'm using a Winsor Newton Series 7. You should get them. They're really great. I didn't believe the hype until I got the brushes myself, and now I really enjoy them, and I'm sad about it because they are very expensive brushes, and it's hard for me to go to back to anything else. So now I'm trapped. You'll love the brush if you use it, but you'll hate it because you can't stand anything else anymore. So just call me an artist snob or something. Whatever makes you feel better for keeping to use your normal brushes. Anything that can help you sleep at night, that's what we're after. So now we've switched over to his, uh, his bolt rifle here. I believe it's a stalker bolt rifle. Still doing the same thing. Just gotta hit all these armor panels um, because these dark angels have these lovely Christmas guns green armor and bright red panels. Now for future Primaris Marines, especially when I get around to painting, you know, a whole bunch of intercessors or something, I'm probably going to put some flair on a few of the weapons just so they don't look so redundant. I really hate having carbon copy uh, models in an army. I know they're all supposed to be uniform and that they have paint schemes and everything and that it's easier if they all look the same. But it just drives me crazy. Like, people aren't just carbon copies of each other. Even in an uh, army like the Dark Angels, where they have so much iconography and they don't really decorate their armor much, they still have little flair. Like, they have to. It's just, that's what humans do. Anyway, there's, there's the end of that rant. So, now we're coming through with some chainmail silver and we're hitting the vents on the power pack. Not really sure if these side vents are vents or not, but for my army, they are. Now we got his uh, his spring and couple of bars. I have no idea what's on the tops of these power packs, but I know what it looks like, and it's some kind of miscellaneous little parts, so we'll get those done too. And now we're off to the uh, metal parts on the guns, and we're still just using chainmail silver for this. I really like this silver paint. It's uh, it's a Vallejo Game Air, so it's their their games their Vallejo game color silver paint, but they have thinned it and maintained the pigment concentration so you can, in theory, take it straight into an airbrush. And I sometimes do, like we saw earlier in the last video. You know, I used it straight into the airbrush. I personally just really like it on the bristle brush because of how thin it is. It has really great coverage and it's thin, it's easy to work. Um, I really like these metallic pigments. I have used um, Reaper metals in the past, and uh, I haven't really tried any of the GW ones because I just got happy with the Vallejo ones. Um, but the Reaper metallic paints were very thick, and they would clump up so fast. It was hard to work with. I found I was thinning them all the time, you know, putting water in with them. And then when you thin metallic paints, it's kind of weird. Like, the pigments, it's almost like they, they separate out from the rest of the model. Or, excuse me, the rest of the paint. They just, like, separate, and then they start floating, and then you've got, like, glitter water, where instead you had silver paint just moments before. So they don't thin very well. Um, now, these you can still thin a little bit if you need to. And just as a quick side, I'm adding a little bit of silver for a couple more buttons on his super-duper smartwatch there. But... If even with like with a thinning medium, so I can take in. I've got some air or uh, airbrush medium that I typically use to thin with now that my flow improver ran out, and the airbrush medium I use it works really well. You know, it's basically the same stuff that the paint is made out of, just without any pigment added in, and 
you can really tell the difference. Like when you thin with water, and I've talked about this before, when you thin with water, you create a, essentially if you want to think about it, like a chemical composition of three different materials. You've got your, your paint medium that was initially there that was mixed with, then you've got your color pigment, and then you've got this water that's supposed to thin it, and it, it can work. But if you have something that's very similar to the initial paint medium that it was mixed with initially, it, it just thins way better. So as a quick aside, now we're coming back through with a little bit of Carolberg Crimson, just straight out of the bottle on the purity seal and just kind of gooping it in. And now I'm doing the same thing to the bolt pistol. I'm just kind of, I, I know how that pistol is going to look like when he's holding it, how it's the model's posed. And I'm just trying to make a gradient transition uh, through the red so it kind of looks like it's lighter at the top and darker at the bottom, kind of like a, a shadow, if you will. That's what I'm after, I'm trying to make a shadow. And to give the flat red panel a little more depth. Uh, I find that when doing this, it looks really sharp. Um, I do this for the, the shoulder pad symbols as well, and it makes them look dynamic, not super flat. And that's really what I'm after. So now I'm just putting a secondary coat of Mephiston Red on the bolt rifle. Just being careful not to bleed too far. We've got this lovely strap that's already been colored and uh, washed, so we don't really want to, you know, have to go back through and repaint that. Uh, even though this is the nature of painting, you know, as as you go along and you paint, you uh, you mess up what you've done, and then you just spend time fixing your mistakes and making more mistakes while trying to fix your others, and it's the vicious cycle. So I've got one last little coat of the Carabrig Crimson going down there in the bottom just to finalize that transition. Um, I was just painting some stuff on the side and I kind of cooked up this little system that I use for these Marines. I was painting an old tactical squad, just kind of working on a different paint scheme for a little while. And that's kind of where I developed this staggered three layer wash approach to tone down the red. And I really like how it turned out on those, so I just kind of made that standard operation going forward. Uh, it, and it's just taking the Caribou Crimson straight out of the bottle, and then kind of putting it on the lower two thirds, and then the lower third, and then uh, the last layer is just right at the very bottom. Kind of almost like the underside of the weapon, if you will, and maybe just bleeding over a little bit so it really hammers in that shadow. Unless there's any other little spots that I feel like need an extra hit of the shade, like maybe, you know, like as a liner in between panels or something. Like, I'll put another one there just so it looks a little more defined. So now we're just hitting those uh, metal pieces on the bolt rifle. Still just going through um, lots of little pieces there, especially like in the bolt magazine. Uh, he's got individual bullets in there. I guess bolter rounds, they're technically like a little projectile missile, right? You, these bolters fire these bolt missiles. Not like traditional ammunition we'd think of, they're these little little rockets that go and explode on impact. So just hitting those and some of this interesting rotational mechanism across the top, which I can only assume is some sort of... I don't know if it's like an ejection manifold, or if it's some kind of cooling thing. It's, it's this interesting little round bit on top. So I let that silver dry, and I'm coming through with some bright bronze, just to give those the kind of a brassy shell. More of what we'd expect for ammunition uh, that we would see today. You know, uh, we you can get some stuff that's got like tin casings, but. Typically, you just got that copper brass type look that gets spit out. So just cleaning up some of my mess when I went through and hit those inner uh, silver parts. Um, so we just have the uniform red coat all the way across. So now we're going to take some of that Phoenix Red mix I talked about from before with the bolt pistol. And we're going to do some edge highlights on the bolter. And if you can see, I'm just kind of I'm hitting the edges of that magazine. Um, there's a lot of fine points on it. And now I'm hitting that top line. I will be lining the panels kind of in that classical GW Tron style with this. It's very subtle, um, but you notice it when you look close. You can see that 
the light has hit it in a special way, and it may look like the paint is worn a little thin on those edges. That's really what I'm after. I kind of want it to look like this is not fresh from the factory, like this is this Marine's weapon. And the paint job may not be the freshest, but he's still got to use it one way or another. We must purge the Xenos. I'm sure if you wanted, you could come through with this and use a, sort of an orange that's not quite a, as close of a match. You could really make it more dramatic, and that would stand out better on the tabletop scale. Um, personally, I prefer smoother transitions, so that's why I build up the colors like this. And you notice I'm applying multiple coats to the same thing over, uh, just so that I have that sort of assured growing color scheme like that. I really want it to be defined and a slow transition. Which is also why I do three tiers on that, uh, the shading of the firearms. So now I'm coming through with Null Noil. Um, you saw I hit a couple of like rings that are holding the, the strap in place. And this is Null Noil straight out of the bottle. I'm just hitting all the silver spots, making them less shiny, a little more grungy. A little bit more like they uh, belong in the 41st millennium, the continuous epic of war. The Null Oil really does a great job of making these look a lot more detailed and shaded. As though you spent a lot more time individually painting them on, and for somebody that doesn't do non-metallic metals, uh, this is really a great way to make your metals look fantastic. I hope soon to be able to take the time to learn some non-metallic metal work. It's a skill that I have tried a couple of times without a whole lot of success. It's kind of hard to pull off. I'm sure once you learn it, it's really easy and it's something I should just sit down and force myself to learn. But right now I have way too much batch painting I need to take care of to have to worry about that. Although soon I hope to be able to sit down and really be able to paint. Uh, I've got a couple of the Privateer Press bus. Those are really cool. They're great detail. I think they're more like a 72 millimeter scale. I'm not really sure on the scaling, but they they're a lot bigger. I've got uh, Pirates, Queen Scars, and I'll probably be starting with hers. I may pick up uh, the Troll one at Gen Con, or maybe Nemo. Nemo's looks pretty cool, too. I may just expand into a few other bus. There's some pretty cool ones I've seen out there in the market, of course. I, I shop a lot, but that doesn't mean I get to buy, but that doesn't stop me from looking. Um, now we've... So, I went and painted this little... It's like a display screen on his wrist, black. And I've got a little bit of uh, Escorpena green, which is just your scorpion green from the game color line. It's a really bright um, green that comes out really thin and covers pretty well. Hitting a few of the buttons too, but I kind of wanted to give a little bit of like a uh, interactive grid type thing going on. And I'm taking and put a little, two little red dots in there to look like enemies. Especially because this pose, and what I've got in mind is him looking over his shoulder uh, at something far away. So it would look like he saw, on um, maybe this is what the Primaris used for an Auspex instead. So maybe he sees something hanging out and goes and wants to take a look at that. Just assessing threats. Uh, then I took a little bit of cyan blue. That was that bright blue I used for the couple of buttons. It's one I've used since I started painting, and I've just always enjoyed using it. It covers so well, and it's such a vibrant color. Unfortunately, my bottle's getting pretty low, so i got to make the tough decision of whether or not to buy another bottle from the Reaper line, or decide if I'll branch into more of the Vallejo game colors. I've been kind of replacing my collection with game colors as they run out. And I don't know, blues are, blues are something I really like. I, one of my favorite colors, so I like to paint them, and... I'm kind of picky with them. Uh, so right now I'm painting in some text. I've just loaded up my brush with some black paint, just the tip, and I'm just kind of scribbling it on. So it looks like there's something actually written in. I just ignore that little fall. Like there's something actually written on the purity seal. I also took a little bit of the red and I highlighted the seal up from the what it was at after we washed it with the Carolberg Crimson. Now I'm taking a little bit of the red and I mixed in some black to kind of really give it, get a dark burgundy kind of muddy red color. And I hit the lenses. I figured the lenses would still be red, but they're not going to be a brighter red like one would typically paint for a Space Marine helmet because he's not wearing it. It's not powered. At least that was kind of my thought process. So now we are taking a little bit of XV-88 and we're just hitting this Imperial Insignia here 
got kind of the wings spread over the skull. I'm gonna paint this gold. And so I just need a little bit of brown underneath to give a good solid gold color. And that actually went really well. That was raised fairly well off the edge there. Now we're coming in with the glorious gold. Just real bright. Yeah, I want this to really be the part on this weapon that stands out. Because it's his little accent piece, you know, it's his decoration. So it should look a lot more different than the rest of the model. So now we're looking at that shoulder pad. Now he is kind of a elite model. He's a, in War Machine and Hordes, you'd call him a solo. So in the Dark Angels army, their squad indicator is a sword. So I could have just used the decal. I probably will in the future ones, but I wanted to show you guys some freehand. I don't get to do that very often. So we just started by drawing a line, and now we're going to put it at the bottom of this line with a diamond. And I'm going to kind of walk through these basic shapes, because that's how I have to paint them. You know, I, I can't just sit down and just envision this sword and paint the outline and then build in from there. I have to build from the middle out. So we did this diamond in the bottom, and then we stretched the diamond up, and now we're putting in the cross hilt on the sword, just trying to get the squad marking down or some semblance of it so that he can fit in with about the rest of the army. Now, some people like to go and put, like, squad numberings in. So, like, if you've got the first tactical squad of your fourth company, you could have, you know, the fourth company knee pad and then a one through the tactical squad marking on the shoulder. I probably won't be doing that because I want my squads to be modular. So, I don't know if you put that through on the elites, you know, if, if you would put a numbering on this or not, I choose not to. I think that would be kind of weird. That sounds weird. But here we're going through, like I was talking with the scaling red. Just, uh, you can see I bled off some of that Carolberg crimson onto my thumb there. Just giving it that same tiered approach so that it'll be brighter up at the top and darker down at the bottom. I have a natural shadow and hopefully some semblance of what it should look like uh, if I was to use a decal. Except... A decal would not have a transitional shading. So I guess there's a benefit to the freehand. If you put a decal on, it's just going to be brightly colored all the way across, which is great for quick identification, but not so great if you're trying to have a realistic looking model all the way across. So now I'm removing all the blue tag that I used to protect the model, or I'm masked with, so that I can put these, uh, these limbs in place. We're getting pretty close on this guy, and time to make sure we have the shading right all the way across on everything and start looking at maybe the last few final touch-up pieces we need before we can call this piece done. Uh, the blue tack is fighting with me a little bit. I was having some trouble getting it out of the backpack, uh, especially because they have such a large cavity back up in there. And normal tactical marines have a huge cavity and then like a little peg. And these guys have got a perfect slot fit, so if it was the huge cavity it wouldn't be an issue. But where it's the slot fit, if I don't get it jammed up in there just right, he's going to have this gap between like his backpack and the rest of his back, and that'll look kind of funky. We don't want him to look funky. We're taking all this time to paint him and make him look nice, so we got to make sure he does look nice. So this blue tack is pretty good. You can just get it from Walmart or whatever your local retailer is. It's just poster putty. That's all it is. And now I am assembling, I do most of my figures, my models, with uh, plastic weld, if I can. Uh, once I paint something and put it all together, I am not likely to break it apart. And swap arms or something. If I get it together, he's together. And if I want to have a different model, I'm going to buy a different one. And paint that one however I wanted that configuration. Because, honestly, I don't play a whole lot. I've been able to sneak in a couple of games of 8th edition... And they've been fun, but for me, it's the modeling. That's what I do. So, if I end up with a few extra models, so be it. They'll look pretty on my shelves, and I'm not going to sweat over it too much. Uh, right now, I'm just hitting in some of the, like, the undersuit I missed when they were separated. Unfortunately, I remembered right when they got put together. Uh, so I went and put some gray primer. Uh, that's the color. It's primer gray with a little bit of uh, the ghost gray mixed in so it was a little bit brighter. I painted over that and then hit it with a dark null oil so that the top parts would be that slightly brighter gray and then the shadows would be that recessed dark gray. So it's kind of just the quick easy way of taking care of that sort of ribbed rubber type look. 
Now I'm coming through with the chainmail silver and I'm just picking out accents. Now I wanted to do highlights with it fully assembled so I could know exactly where the light's hitting. So if you notice, the bolt rifle is at kind of a weird angle. It's sort of like 20, 25 degrees off of the top. And so the light's not perfect at a 45. I figured it would be easier to get the highlights right if it was actually in place. Normally, if it was something predictable, um, I would just highlight while they were separate so I could make sure I don't have any potential issues with paint getting anywhere it's not supposed to. But with this one, I thought it would be better to do a full assembly and then finish up. Uh, so just hitting anything metallic that looks like it should be standing out. Uh, little accents on the locks and the tops of the little bird cage. If you've got uh, gold pieces, you can actually highlight the tops with silver and then it'll look like lights just glancing off them. It's kind of a little trick. Because you think, what are you going to highlight gold with, right? It's yellow. So you got to have some kind of lighter gold, but if you put gold on gold, it's just going to look like gold. Unfortunately, the gold pigments don't stack as well as the silver ones do. So if you take a little bit of silver and you hit those top points, so you're only kind of doing like the, the sheen layer, if you will. If you were painting a gem, it'd be like the, the ting, that last little piece. That's the, the silver part we're after. So, just picking out the last couple of points, there's a lot of little stuff that I could be doing on these firearms, his pistol and his rifle. Um, I tried to grab as much of them as I could, at least reasonably. You gotta be careful, because if you do too much, it starts to stand out, or you're, you lose your shadow. You know, you took the time, you put the null oil on, you darkened it up. If you hit everything that you just darkened with the wash, so it's light again, you don't have a difference between the dark and the light. And if you don't have... A dark without some light or a light without some dark you don't have a painting you just have a wall and if you've got a wall you may as well have just rolled it on with like a you know big old foam roller or something so uh, I'm just hitting rivets right now he's got these little rivets across the backpack they are a very small detail if you don't want to do them uh, you don't have to people aren't gonna notice there's something that I just like because they're there and I tried to just paint this as best as I could since everything's there and it's such a great sculpt, as usual, from GW. Uh, you gotta hand it to him. Once in a while there's a quality issue and they change their rules up all the time, but uh, for the most part, the models are pretty damn crisp. So now we're just gonna do the face here. Uh, he's the only part that needs, still needs to be done. So we're just gonna do the typical eye technique I use. So that's where you take black, put the black down, and then you're gonna follow through with a little bit of white for the inner eyes and then you're gonna hit with a pupil and then paint flesh tone around and leave like almost like he's got eyeliner so that the eyes are very distinct very noticeable and unfortunately this is gonna take me a couple of tries uh, shaky hands being what they are means sometimes the brush tip doesn't go where it's supposed to and I've tried a number of different methods for you know clamping my hands together holding them just right and some, soon I hope to be able to have a video to show you some of these different arm stabilization techniques I use. So that if you are a shaky painter like me, you can try and pull off some of this stuff. And pretend like you kind of know what you're doing. Because uh, when you can do eyes or something that look great and just baffle everybody in your life that looks at your painting, uh, it's a special feeling. So, I, this is me just having issues with the eyes. And this is just kind of how it's going to be for a little while. So while I'm sitting here struggling with eyes, uh, do you guys play 40k? Um, I know I've got a number of people that just like to watch. They like to put me on as background noise, and uh, it's happy to have you here with us. Um, but what do you play? Um, I think I've, I've asked this before, and I've gotten some, some Iron Hands, I think, or some Imperial Fists. Um... I feel like I had somebody tell me once they painted Storm Ravens. Uh, lots of cool stuff. Just let me know, and if you've got pictures, I mean, load them up on Imgur or something and uh, send me a link. I'd love to see them. I like to look at other people's art. So I finally got those eyes sorted. I, I had to pull them off camera. Um, unfortunately, the camera was just in my face, and I, I had to be able to see a little bit better. Uh, so we've got eyes taken care of, and now we're just doing some some light skin tone. Uh, since the Dark Angels are a lot of, we'll say, they, they kind of have a real heavy Arthurian theme, 
like Arthur and Camelot stuff. So European type thing. So most of the guys I paint up will probably be Caucasian just to kind of follow that sort of theme. But who knows, I may throw some surprises in once in a while. So we started with the white primer. It really makes this process easier. I have thinned down the skin tone paint a lot. This is tanned highlight we're putting on. This is one of the many Reaper flesh tone paints. Uh, when I first started, I ended up buying, I think, all of the Caucasian line. So I have everything in steps from like the uh, pale highlight to um, like uh, tanned um, shadow. I think it's the darkest one I've got. Everything across the whole spectrum. And they're pretty convenient, uh, especially like if I'm ever painting something and I come back to it later. Uh, they're pretty easy to mix again. So like if I'm not taking something straight out of the bottle, I can usually do like, oh, well, I'm using tanned highlight and one drop of XV88 or something like that to darken it further. Or, you know, one dab of black in with this color will be this. And it's easier to remember than, you know, like, two parts brown, one part white, one part yellow, and one part blue. <laughs> That's way too complex for me. I'm not smart enough to handle that. So now we're taking a little bit of the fair shadow color, and I have thinned it down a lot, so we're applying it as like a glaze. Um, I'm hitting a couple of the areas, just your light areas. So around the hairline, kind of at the crest of the head, I'm getting across the eyebrows and his defined cheekbones the tip of his nose, the edges of his mouth and his lips, you know, all those places where the skin is starting to stand out and you may have a lighter appearance because it's not as bright or it's, uh, it's the skin is flexed, if you will. So it's not gonna be as dark looking because direct light's hitting it, you know, those sorts of things. You know what I'm talking about. Look in the mirror, you'll see it. So I put a little bit of a dark red color in his mouth just a little bit of a dab just to give it some of that shadow since his mouth is kind of open. He's got sort of a scowl going on, but it is definitely open. So I'm coming through. This is a Reichland Flesh Shade. I have thinned this down one to one, which is what I typically do for faces. Otherwise, I find it, it, the spots where it pools and dries, like in this case his mouth or uh, like the edges of the visor, it ends up drying super dark and it looks uncharacteristic. So there, after the Reichland dries, I was just adding a little bit more of like a purple mix from just whatever I had on the palette to uh, give him more of a mouth type coloration, if you will. So it looks like he has a mouth, maybe some teeth or some red tissue on the inside of your mouth like people typically do. Now we're stepping into, also from the Reaper line, the blonde hair and blonde shadow colors. This is the blonde shadow going on right now. Um, it's the darker kind of a little more orangey color. I guess it's not really orange, but it's like your your blonde color with some brown added to it, so it's darker. And I'm sorry this is a little bit blurry. I had to hold this head closer to me, uh, closer than I typically do, uh, so that I could see it and make sure what I was doing uh, would work. Because um, the eyes just aren't as good as they used to be, unfortunately. So I'm sorry that I didn't adjust the zoom. Uh, I'll, I'll correct that in future videos, and. Hopefully won't have to worry about it soon when, uh, ideally, fingers crossed, I can be getting a new camera soon uh, for painting specifically. So I don't have to worry about swapping camera settings or messing with all the fun things that result from uh, Logitech software glitches, which happen all the time. The C920 is a great camera. That's what I have used to film painting for a long time. But by God, is that software a pain in the ass. So we I was just doing some painting his eyebrows and now we're highlighting the eyebrows this is the blonde highlight it's a lot more yellow and white uh, it's brighter so I'm hitting the edges of his hair he's got kind of some fine detail in his buzz cut his mohawk buzz cut in the front edges kind of like hair fibers uh, I'm bleeding off a lot of the excess so because I don't want color bleed I want a little bit of an edge highlight and then I'm gonna take and diffuse a little bit of the color across the top uh, for like a cranial type coloration just a slight dusting and I'm really working to get it off uh, the brush so that I don't deposit a lot so if you deposit a lot then uh, it's like I said earlier you're no longer painting something precise you're just painting a color it doesn't look as good so now I've got kind of a, a little bit of a bristle brush this is a different one it's an older stippling brush that I've kind of 
used. It was a nice liner brush at one time, but has just had a, a plenty of abuse since then. And that did the job. That was able to stipulate like I wanted. So now we're taking a little bit of Thin Down Agrax Earthshade. And I just want to give a little bit of a, it's a wash, but it's kind of more like a glaze. I'm just hitting the hair and I'm trying to bring the colors in to kind of blend them together with a liquid wash, like I typically do. And I'm trying to get a little bit on the edges of where the scalp meets the hairline so that there'd be a little bit of a darker line to mark the transition between the colors. And I want to bring the eyebrows down so they're not too bright and distracting. The eyes ended up really good on this model and I was really happy with them. So I, I wanted to make sure they weren't just obnoxious. So yeah, he's just got this great grimace and he's looking over to the side. You know, a little tip for the eyes, when you're painting to the side, they look a lot more natural than if you just do straight up the middle. Sometimes, based on the pose, you gotta do to the middle. But this one, I was able to get away with the side. So I took a little bit of ghost gray and I just hit his teeth real quick. I was able to get a real fine point and just put a little bit of a splash of white in there. So I got that darker red I put in earlier um, and then a little bit of white. Now, if you see there, I don't know if you can see it, it's really small. He's got two service studs up in his, his forehead. So I painted them both with the silver and then I hit one with the, the bright bronze so that it'll look like two different year increments or something. Um, which is kind of an interesting question. I don't know uh, why the Primaris Marines have service studs. I think, I thought they'd been in like hiding for a long time. Like nobody knew about them, they were just hanging out on Mars. So now I'm, I'm painting, I was painting some lips. So I thinned down some Reichland flesh shade and I added a little bit of red to it. Just, it's super thin. And he's got these scars kind of all over his face from shrapnel and stuff because he's a dumbass and doesn't wear his helmet in the future with all sorts of, you know, head exploding, armor piercing ammunition and stuff. Uh, so he's got these scars all over. I just really wanted to accent them. He's even got one going through his eyebrow, so. I just put some of that in. Uh, it was really thin. I was hoping it would sink down into the the crevice so that it would uh, just kind of, it would stick in that recess and the color would manifest. And it actually did. I was surprised. I thought maybe the crevice would be too small. I must have had a good mix because it, it stuck. You could see the scars. Uh, it ended up looking really good. Um, he even had one of those scars going through one of his lips. So he this guy's got some nice scar tissue on his face. Um, now we're just going to mount the head. Now these guys, they have a two pose head position. So you can either have them looking like that, or you can have them looking, oh, I guess we're going to do that one again. I was just kidding, psyched you out. Now we're going to go to that side. So I took a good look at both. Um, based on the pose and kind of what I had in mind for his base, that side just didn't look as good as that side. So yeah, we're going to take a little bit of that same plastic weld glue, and we're going to plop that head in place. And now he is all glued together. Pretty happy about that. And that's going to pretty much do it for us. We've got this guy all painted up. He's looking good. Uh, we've got this nice, cool armor technique. And I'm just really overall pleased with how he turned out. I think he looks really good. And in the next video, we're going to be putting him on a really fancy base so that he looks awesome and kicks ass. Uh, but that's it for today. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them below. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do so so you can be notified when additional content comes out. And as always, until next time, happy painting.